What if the key to solving a double homicide comes down to one bullet, but the science behind the bullet is just kind of guesswork? I'm Tony Bruschi. Today, we're diving headfirst into one of the most controversial elements in the case against Richard Allen, the so-called forensic, and I'm putting it in air quotes, science of bullet markings. Prosecutors are betting everything on a single unspent bullet found at the Delphi crime scene, claiming it matches Allen's gun. But here's the problem. This science isn't airtight. It's not DNA. It's not a fingerprint. It's subjective and more like an opinion than a fact. The deeper we go, the murkier the waters get. We'll break down how the state is building its case on tool mark analysis, a field that assumes the slightest mechanical nicks and scratches are unique enough to link a bullet casing to one specific gun. But what if those same marks could come from any number of firearms? What if investigators are chasing a mirage, convincing themselves of a connection that doesn't really exist? Beyond the courtroom, there's a bigger psychological question at play. Why would a system cling so fiercely to questionable evidence? Is it desperation for a conviction? A desire to close the case at any cost, even if it means Bending the science to fit a narrative? What happens to public trust in a justice system if we convict the wrong man based on junk science? If Allen didn't do it and the science won't hold up, then the real killer has slipped through the cracks. But if the state can't prove its case with certainty, how does the town of Delphi and the grieving families move forward from all of this? It's a trial with very high stakes built on fragile foundations. We're here to pull apart every twist and turn. Joining me is retired FBI Special Agent Jennifer Coffendaffer. I, I was hoping uh, that they would be proving us all wrong. Not that I hope Richard Allen is guilty, but I'm hoping they're going to figure out who the hell did this for the sake of these families. And if it's him, it's him. But I was thinking, just by the way they were so just belligerent, uh, and the state is what I'm talking about, how Gull was, was so belligerent, outside to any of their requests, any of their motions, to the public questioning, to the pressure that was put on it. We got our guy. We got our guy. Okay, well, let's see in court what you got. They got nothing. <laughs> I mean, they're really not presenting a strong case. I was hoping there's a lot of things behind the curtain that we are just unaware of, and it, they're going to prove us wrong. They're proving their incompetency uh, even better than I think we ever thought. Well, you know, one of the pieces of evidence that came out that uh, is confusing to me is the note where he says, I'm ready to confess. <laughs> yeah. And if you compare that, and again, we don't have the actual note. We have a replica where, in other words, that reporter's looking at it, and then on his notes or her notes, they're, they're writing, they're mm -hmm. taking care to make it look exactly the same, right? Where yeah. capitals are capitals or slanted or mm -hmm. inserted at different places. But compare that note to the note he wrote when he wanted counsel. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, the note where he wanted counsel is, is beautiful writing. It's all, I mean, comparatively, it's all in line. It's, it's well organized. It's, I mean, that note that was presented, it looks like either the ravings of a madman or of a, a young child. Yes. It's, it's a hot mess. And I just don't understand uh, what change that would make one's style go from when you're asking for attorney, big deal, when you're getting ready to confess, a big deal, that the writing would change so uh, strangely. Well, a mental breakdown is what would cause exactly it. <laughs> being tortured for a year in solitary confinement when you haven't done anything wrong. That's what I think would would lead to that. What's been your reaction thus far on on the confessions themselves? Because this was a big one going in. We got sixty confessions, and all they've shown us thus far is a piece of paper, like you said, that looks like it was written by a madman or a child. I would say a drunk child at that, because I think even like a regular child that's not under the influence of something could probably write better. Um, so I'm going to go with drunk 11 year old writing that one uh, is another possibility. Um, but what about the confession? We've yet to hear one. I thought, you know, I think that was a big thing we were all thinking of. OK, let's hear the audio of these confessions from the prison. We haven't heard anything. And I'm wondering why that is. 
Well, you know, it's it's back to the order of proof. So whenever you're putting a case like this together, typically what happens is the prosecutor is going to sit down with the investigators and they're work, going to work very deliberately on putting together the order of proof that's most convincing for a jury. Mm -hmm. Personally, for me, I, I see what they're doing. You know, they first of all want to shock the jury with all those photos, the autopsy photos. They want to grab the jury and say, Somebody is going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We got the somebody and he's sitting right there. Yeah. So I'm not at all surprised with that order that they decided to come out with. And now they're kind of doing this chronology. And I think they realize that their witnesses are weak, super weak, and their evidence is weak. So they're kind of getting this over right now in a lull, and then they want to hit home, I think, with the confessions and the ballistic information to have the last thing in the jurors' minds. So I think that that's, Tony, why they're doing the order of proof this way. Are, do you think we're going to hear confessions? We're going to hear the actual audio of him making those confessions? Or do you think maybe that audio is just so weak and really the ravings of a madman that it, it's not really usable? Well, they're going to have to play the confessions, I think, and introduce them. If they don't, they will be extremely remiss. But it's up to the prosecution to decide. I think the most important confessions, though, are the ones made early on. I believe there were five, four to the wife and one to the mother. Mm -hmm. Those are most important because one could argue that, well, the other 50-some-odd were made to make him look crazy mm -hmm. and that really the good ones, the real ones are the first five. So I want to see what's in the first five. Yeah. Um, if they start picking and choosing, in other words, there's 61 and they take number, you know, one and 15 and 40 yeah. <laughs> uh, that says what they want to say, say uh, hopefully the defense and the defense seems to be on top of this. Uh, hopefully the defense will, uh, you know, point that out and, yeah. and play the other ones. The, the defense for sure should play all 61. I want to hear all 60. I want to hear every single one that is recorded and on the record, because I think that will show a very interesting human being right there. Um, and it could go either way, I guess. But I don't think we're going to hear a very well, competent human being uh, making all of those. Or it may digress or it may, I don't know. I don't know what to expect. Uh, let's talk about the ballistics here, because that seems to be the only thing that the prosecution thinks they have going for them of this unspent bullet that was found on the ground after all of the officers came into the scene and took a look at it. And so God knows how many you had wandering around there at the scene. And if you just kind of play the odds of maybe somebody dropping a bullet, hmm, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 officers wandering around this crime scene versus the one man who was walking around dropping a bullet who said he had nothing to do with it, was just out there hiking. Uh, I think your odds are clearly in one uh, direction. And, and, but they have the argument of, well, it fits like it it, it, uh, it would have gone through his gun. The markings show that, which is also a science that's not super reliable. Why? Wh what, what do they have here on this bullet that really they think they can show went through his gun and it wasn't cycled through any other of the many other guns who have, would have been on that scene from the officers? Well, to me, the biggest item that I hope the defense did, and I, I don't know, I did see they already had one of their experts kicked out. I think they're called a metallologist, mm -hmm. uh, basically somebody to talk about metal markings, but they weren't a firearms expert, had never testified about firearms. And so the judge, Judge Gold said, you're out. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully the tool marks expert, and that's what they're called, either hopefully has FBI experience, if not ATF experience, that are truly uh, experts. In other words, that's what they did all day long was sit in their chair and look at tool marks on cartridges and on, uh, you know, on bullets, on spit rounds and so on. Hopefully that's what they've got. Uh, if they have someone like that, then I'll say again, yeah. hopefully they actually examined his gun. Where is against this gun? That. I, uh, well, it should be in evidence. Yeah. Uh, but they should have pulled that out, and I never saw any orders along this line. And I tell you, I think this could be major because you saw in the um, ruling by the judge just yesterday, I believe it was, saying, listen, plus this guy, not only is he not a firearms expert, he is not an expert in terms of 
uh, he didn't look at it. He didn't look at, at Richard Allen's gun. He didn't conduct any ballistic shooting from Richard Allen's gun or ejection of a bullet from Richard Allen's gun. That's a big problem. So I'm hopeful that the defense knew to get Richard Allen's gun out of lockup, uh, the evidence room, and actually perform these tests. What I also hope they did, or what they should have done, was taken similar big, sour, 40 caliber handguns and maybe tested 100 of them that were produced in that exact same year and even tried to find some that maybe had uh, in the similar serial number strand uh, and see if the two a mark left from the ejection from the ejector and the extractor match mm -hmm. that would be an amazing expert if they get somebody on the stand that hasn't examined his gun and how it treated another bullet mm -hmm. they're going to be in big trouble the defense so here we are what started as a search for justice now feels more like a game of smoke and mirrors the state's reliance on dubious bullet science combined with shaky confessions and weak witnesses. It paints a troubling picture of a justice system's priorities. Instead of facts, they're leaning on perception, trying to push a jury towards an emotional outrage outcome rather than offering them solid proof. And that's a dangerous game. The real tragedy? If Richard Allen is innocent, then a murderer has been out there for nearly a decade, unnoticed, unpunished, and free. And all because the system might have been too stubborn or some individuals in the system might have been too stubborn or too desperate to look beyond the first convenient suspect that came along. But here's a tough question. We've left, we're left with this to think about. If the prosecution's case collapses, will anyone in power admit they were wrong? Or will they quietly sweep it under the rug and move on to the next story? I'm Tony Bruschi. If you want to stay up to date with this case and the others that we cover, be sure to press subscribe wherever you are getting podcasts. Hey, thanks for checking out the video. Be sure to follow us wherever you download podcasts, and especially Apple Podcasts, where you can get advanced episode and premium content on our premium channel right there. Also, be sure to follow us on social media so you don't miss any breaking updates on the stories that matter to you most. We're on TikTok, X, Instagram, Facebook. Just search Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi, and you'll find us right there. Again, thanks for watching.